Blessings. Have you destroyed the power of the thief, the power of the devourer, and the power of dishonor? Have you destroyed those satanic powers in your life as a believer? The spirit of the thief, the spirit of dishonor, the spirit of lack, have you defeated those demons in your life as a born again child of, child of God? Now, let's look at this right here. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Apostle Paul apostolically is dealing with a realm of the apostolic that gives you the advantage as a child of God. It gives you the advantage. It takes you into magnifying the Lord. It's a weapon in the kingdom called sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. Apostle Paul is talking about this sowing anointing, this sowing glory, and this reaping glory, and how to walk in it. Something that was magnified to me was this in verse seven. He said, every man as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. So giving is something that God pits in your authority. It's not in God's authority. He pits it in your authority to give. So it's a decision that you make just like prayer. Is a decision that you make just like fasting. It's a decision that you make just like reading the word. It's a decision that you make just like forgiving somebody. But he puts it in your ball court. He doesn't force you to do it. He doesn't make you do it. He doesn't manipulate you to do it. This is something that he will give you the power to do, but he won't do it for you. It says, every man as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Now, this is the man doing this. The man has to get a revelation. Not grudgingly or necessity. Do you know what this means? You know, when we deal with grudges, we're dealing with regret. When somebody has a grudge against somebody, they're bitter. So if somebody has a grudge against another woman, that means that she's bitter towards that woman. Like she has a wrong perception of that woman. That woman angers her. Think about that. Like that woman gets on her nerves. So the reason why she's carrying a grudge against that other person is because of the perception she has of that person, how she feels about that person, and it's wrong. So saints, when we deal with grudges, not grudgingly, we're dealing with the fact that when you choose to operate in sowing, you can't sow with a bad perspective of God. You can't sow with a wrong mentality. You have to understand his character. Or, you, or even if you start sowing, you're not going to sow correct because of how you see God. So when you start sowing, you're going to think that now I got to become homeless. When you start sowing, you're going to think, oh, well, how am I going to pay this bill? When you start sowing, you're going to say, well, how, oh, how is this going to work out in my life? I need this money. I need this. And now you done killed the sowing grace to even sow because you done naturalized this supernatural weapon. In all actuality, sowing does not leave you with less. Sowing just is a discovery of more. It's you locating more which you're going to need more if you're going to fulfill your destiny. When you come into this life, it's so easy for you to naturalize the concept of God having abundance for you. 
Because you can say, well, I don't need all that. I don't want all that. But guess what? Having all of that will empower you to walk in love towards people, even in greater presentations. If you buy a woman a ring from a gumball machine and you buy a woman a ring that has diamonds in it, it has different reactions. Not saying that the gumball machine not going to bring joy. But if you buy somebody a ring that has diamonds in it, there's going to be a different reaction. The same way if you give somebody a used blanket that got Snickers bar residue on it, mayonnaise, smell funny, you give it to them, they'll take it, right? But if you give somebody... Uh, uh, a name brand blanket that smells great and it looks great and it's soft and it's cuddly, there's going to be a different reaction coming from the person. Why? Because the, the quality of what you have given them is even more wealthier. It's more enriching. It's more beautified. So when they take it, they feel even a stronger wave of love coming from you. They feel like you care about them because they see that it was much value in this thing coming to them from you. They know that you spent a lot of money. They knew that. Now, imagine this. Wealth empowers you to show the love of God to people that God will put in your presence in a luxurious way. The love of God in itself is luxurious. The love of God in itself is an extravagant experience. So imagine if you say I'm born again and I love God and I love God with all my heart. Think about that. Think about what you're saying. So that means that you love God, meaning that you love who he is and he's an extravagant giver. So if you really love him, you actually have to become what he is. So saints, think about it like this. If you live your whole life in, in, in this earth and never become wealthy and rich, how much love could you have shown to people for the gospel's sake? And how much more effective you could have sponsored the gospel? When a person sets out to sow, they're engaging the wealth covenant with them and God. The wealth power of God is in sowing money because God uses money as a test to your life so that you can see whether or not you trust him, whether or not he is your source. Because anybody can say that God is their source, but what do you do with money? Money will expose you on whether you trust God as your source or if you trust flesh and blood, you trust the natural realm. In Genesis, God created the first man to sow. A lot of men are not sowers. A lot of men are denying who they were created to be. They were created to sow. The first man that God created, the first object that he gave him was a seed. He didn't give him a child. He didn't give him a house. He didn't give him a baby. He didn't give him a wife. The first object he put in his hands was a seed. That shows you that the seed is really the first priority of man. Sowing. God put that first thing in his hands because that's what he was supposed to be doing, sowing into his God. So imagine if you come into this earth realm and you never identify with what God enjoys, which is sowing. The Lord has a desire for money to be sown into him. 
You see him crying out through Malachi, will a man rob God? What kind of question is that? They told us that God is all everything. He don't need nothing. He This stuff down here can't bother him. He good. He don't want nothing from us. He got everything. That's what they told us down here. But Malachi came screaming with a message of the seed. And Malachi said, will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? And then watch what he said. He didn't say you rob God because you don't pray. He didn't say you rob God because you don't fast. He didn't say you rob God because you don't read the law. He said you rob God in your sowing. That giving aspect, you have alienated yourself from the Lord. You don't have no communication towards the Lord with your money, with your provision. You're not communicating to him that you trust him. You're not communicating to him that you love him. You're not communicating honor to him with what you have. Will you rob God? I'm not a hypocrite of this. I have, I am a strong, radical sower. I sow money all the time into the gospel, all the time. I sow money all the time into the gospel. As a matter of fact, there's no investment that I've made in my life more than into the gospel. I've sown more into the gospel than anywhere, any place, anything. Because the seed unlocks the lifestyle that you're really supposed to live. When you start sowing into God, it is a prayer system that you're operating in. You're communicating with him. And he hears you, your desperation for his help, your readiness for his guidance, and your seriousness about the abundant life that he created you to have. Now, look what it says right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. It says, not grudgingly nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, why does it talk about necessity? Don't sow out of necessity. Because there's a spirit that happens when you're need-minded. You don't listen to God correctly. Necessity actually makes you rob God. Because in, when you're thinking about the region of necessity, you'll start thinking about what you need so much that you will, you will affect the seed that God wants you to sow. Like for instance, if somebody wants to buy a new chair for their house and God tells them to sow a certain amount of money, if they exalt the necessity of that chair, they actually won't sow the amount of money that God wants them to sow because that, that necessity is now, it, it is um, interrupting the flow to listen to God. So God may say, okay, I want you to do this, but then they can't do it because that flow of necessity is blocking the flow of sowing. So hereby you understand why 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, don't sow grudgingly nor of necessity. And then look what it says right here. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Now here's the shocking thing about this. It's telling you what God loves. So God loves somebody that's cheerfully giving money to him. This is what God loves. Imagine if you are a man or a woman and you say, I want to seek the Lord. I want the Lord to be pleased with me. I want the Lord to love me. I want the Lord to bless me. And, and you, you have that mindset, right? Which the Lord loves you, whether or not you so. Whether the, and, and the Lord, he, the shocking thing is he blesses you whether or not you sow. But the things that he does is all a test. So if the Lord blesses you, right, it's a test. Because his goodness is supposed to bring you into the realm called repentance. And how many of you all know that repentance is really this? You're turning away from what Satan wants you to do to do what God wants you to do. So if he gives you goodness to lead you to repentance, that means that God will actually give you money. He'll give you opportunities. He'll bless you so that you can learn how to sow. 
So if if he if he's good to you and you never start sowing, you never repented. So a lot of times people say, well, well, God is good to me all the time. Yeah, but that means how much God going to judge you because the fact that he was good to you and you never sold, you never learned how to be good back to God with sowing into him and he was sowing into you. That means that you're a thief. You're robbing them. But see, once you start repenting, you start realizing, oh, the Lord is actually ministering seed to me so I can sow. He's ministering a way to me so that I can minister back to him. Saints, let me just say this to you and always remember this. Do not be guilty. Of taking God's investments and never investing, learning the fun of investing back into God. Never become guilty of that. Even if a woman is taken care of by a man and she never sows into the man, she will become that man's enemy over time. It may not be immediate, but it will manifest her being an enemy because while the man is given to her, if she doesn't have a heart to sow back into the man, that relationship is now manipulation. And that's the same way it goes vice versa. If a woman is given to a man, the man doesn't give back to her. If, um, if, um, if children are receiving from their parents and they never give back to their parents, they never start serving and helping their parents and sowing back into their parents, they will become rebellious towards their parents. Because the way that God created things to, to work is seed sowing, it establishes a pure relationship. So a lot of believers that say that they're believers, their relationship is not even pure with God because they don't sow no seed. And so their sensitivity with God is off. So if the Lord wants them to change the company that they're hanging around with, they will never do it because they they have no sensitivity to what the spirit wants. Because the relationship is not pure, it's one-sided. See, God is going to be good all the time. Remember, it says that he can't deny himself. So he's going to be good, but the goodness of God is not going to keep you from hell. The goodness of God is an opportunity for you to learn the ways that keep you from hell. The goodness of God will not keep you from hell, but it will release an empowerment to you so that you can learn the laws and instructions that God has for your life to keep you from hell. Saints, the Bible talks about a person in the Bible in, in Matthew chapter 25. He did not sow. And as a result of it, King Jesus said in the parable, take this man out into outer darkness, cast him into outer darkness. And it says, uh, for he is an unprofitable servant. Now, this is shocking to me. And it will always remain shocking to me. But I understand this. Why would the Lord call him an unprofitable servant? See, saints, the Lord wants to do business on earth with you. See, he didn't just create you just to save you from sin. After he saved you from sin, he got some business that he want to accomplish with you. He wants you to be his business partner. What did King Jesus say? I must be about my father's business. King Jesus is dealing with business talk here as a business anointing. So King Jesus tells this parable that the man that did not sow, let me see if I can go there. The man that did not sow, he said, cast this man out into outer darkness, which is scary because he said, send a man to hell because a man refused to sow. Now, this in itself, it, it is a quickening thing 
Because this man's eternity was tied into his seed. Now, you might say, according to your natural self, that no, that's not the case. We believe the word of God, not you. I know sometimes people try to exalt themselves and try to come up with their theory. Let me tell you something, your, 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 um, your philosophy can't change truth. But truth can change your philosophy. <laughs> so we have a story here where the man ends up losing his soul because he didn't sow. Which is shocking to me. Because now King Jesus is bringing the seed into a matter of eternal life. How sowing is connected to your eternal life in heaven. Imagine if you don't truly worship God down here, why are you going up to heaven for all eternity to worship God? That's, that's a lie. If somebody has a baby shower down the street and you don't show up there and then they got a greater party. You didn't show up there at the baby shower with a gift. Why are they going to invite you to the greater party at the bigger mansion? Because guess what? You didn't even sow nothing at the baby shower down the street. Down the street was going to indicate whether the bigger mansion was going to be a qualification for you. So if you don't learn how to sow into God down here on earth, how are you going to sow into God for all eternity? And sowing is not hard. It's actually harder. It's, it's hard to rob God. Sowing is actually easier than robbing God. Because Robin God came from Satan, Lucifer, a defeated foe. Satan hates the idea of sowing and reaping because it reminds Satan of the privileges that Satan deceives Satan's self out of. When you start honoring God with your life and what you have, now, Proverbs chapter three explains what honor is about. It says, honor the Lord with your money. Honor the Lord with your money. So we can't honor God with prayer. Alone. We can't honor God with reading the Bible alone. We honor the Lord with money. That's not hard to understand. Number one, once you realize that God is actually putting money in your hands, it becomes easier for you to become sensitive to know that I have a part to play to minister some money back to God. The Lord seeks for somebody that will learn the sowing river that he walks in. Because God is a sower. If you don't become a sower, you have to deny who God is. Because God is a sower. God wanted salvation to come to the earth. And he dealt with seed. He said, her seed shall crush the head of the serpent in the book of Genesis. He dealt with her seed. He dealt with a seed principle in order to bring you to salvation. So the seed is something magnified by God. You can't walk in the true fear of God without sowing. And you can't really say that you're perfect in the love of God without sowing. Because love makes you sow. Love anoints you to sow. You can't sow If you hate God, but you can sow if you love God. It's not hard to understand sowing because 
You sew all the time. You have never walked into a restaurant by yourself and walked out with food that you ordered without paying for it. Or somebody paid for it. Or there was some type of transaction that went on to waive the fee. Somebody dealt with the bill, but it was a price. You have never went inside of IHOP and sold money to IHOP and not got food. The food, you sold money. There was food and you sold money. Food was given and you sold money. We do that all the time. A man of God that's sent by God, that's giving you the food of the word, it's not hard to understand that the divine reaction to that man of God is to sow money to him. Now, if that's hard, it's not because the principle is hard. It's just because your heart is hard. That can change. Remember, all of God's instructions is easy. Now, it can become hard if your heart is hard. Remember the children of Israel, their heart became hard. And remember, what did Moses say? Let my people go that they may worship. The whole worship thing became hard because their heart was hard. Let's go ahead to, um, I want to read this one more time. I want to read this one more time. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30, is talking about King Jesus telling about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he says that there's a man that gives money out. The man gives money to one, five talents. He gives money to another, two talents. And he gives money to another, one talent. Now, why would King Jesus liken his kingdom to money being given out? The same thing I'm teaching you right now. And so King Jesus is likening the kingdom of heaven to a money test here. This is what Matthew 25 verse 14 and 30 is all about. It's about a money test. Now, since this shows you that you have to be trained to sow because the soul don't it does not receive sowing automatically. The soul actually resists sowing. The soul will receive the idea of prayer faster than sowing. You know why? Because prayer is something you do with your mouth. Sowing is something that you have to do with your heart because it's a part of your planning. When money comes into your hands, this can buy, it can sell, it can create, it can attract. When you give this to God, you giving a part of yourself over to the Lord. Your soul is in this. Because your soul thought about things to get this. Your soul was at work in order for you to acquire this. And so when you give this to the Lord, now your soul is dying to itself. To receive what God wants to do. And so your soul has to be trained and broken out of keeping this from the Lord, hiding it. Because see, even when people call on the name of the Lord, they still hide this from the Lord. Because all they offer to the Lord is this mouth. But a true offering didn't come from the mouth. Our offering is where you give money.
uh, 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 honor is where you sow into the Lord money. So Matthew chapter four, uh, Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30. King Jesus is telling a parable to compare his kingdom. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, um, a businessman that's traveling from a far country. And he called all his servants and delivered unto him his goods. Now, this shows you what your life is all about. When money coming into your hands, the Lord is delivering unto you his goods. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory. 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 The kingdom of heaven is where the Lord is the businessman. King Jesus himself. And he is letting you borrow his goods. He gives you favor with a boss. You get a job, you make money. He gives you favor with social security. They give you a check. He gives you favor with some person that's investing in you. They give money to your hands, but it's a test. Look at how the Lord is explaining his kingdom of heaven to you. Now, this is shocking because he said it's the kingdom of heaven. Now, where's the place that you want to go after you die? Heaven, right? Well, look what he just said. The kingdom of heaven is like a man that is a businessman and he transfers his goods, his money to three different servants. So if I have heaven on my agenda, I'm learning about the heavenly conduct. Wow. Sowing is heavenly conduct. Sowing is is the behavior system of the citizens of heaven. Glory, glory, glory. Sowing is the behavioral pattern of eternal life recipients. How many of y'all just caught that? Sowing is the behavioral pattern of eternal life recipients. Look, saints, this in your Bible, you're going to have to read this for yourself and look at this. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30, King Jesus is saying, my kingdom of heaven is like a businessman that goes to a far country, but he calls his own servants to him and gives them his goods, his money. This in your Bible. Wow. The Lord is saying my kingdom is like a man that is a businessman that gives money to the people to test their hearts to see if they're going to truly worship. If they're going to truly listen. Look at this people of God. Matthew chapter 25. Is talking about, verse 14 through 30, is talking about how the kingdom of heaven works. God blesses you with opportunities. He put it in your power for you to get money. And then he tests you to see what you're going to do with that money. If you're going to prioritize to sow into the Lord, sow into your teacher, because how could you sow into the Lord? You can't throw your money up in the sky and hope that it reached to heaven. You sow into the Lord because he's going to have a teacher. Ephesians chapter, uh, no, no, no. Is that Galatians 6? It says, let him that is taught the word communicate with him that teaches in all things. Let me just clarify. Galatians chapter 6. Um, yeah, Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. It says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. See, sometimes you might look at somebody like a prophet Joshua Holmes and say, well, sow into me. You're not my soul. 
And how I got to where I am is by working my soul. You see what I'm saying? I can't break protocol of the spirit and sow into you just because you think that I'm supposed to sow into you. But guess what? She, I'm actually sowing into you right now. <laughs> because the sower soweth the word, Mark chapter four. That's what I'm doing. I'm sowing into you every time I'm sowing this word into you. I'm already sowing. My job as a teacher is to sow the word of God into you. The student job is to sow money, to sow attentiveness, to sow loyalty, to sow servanthood, to help me out. But the teacher's job is to sow the word. That's our job. So look what Galatians chapter six, verse six. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth. This means that the Lord going to send you a soul that's going to teach you the word. Your soul not going to rob you of the word. They're going to sow great seeds of mysteries, which I do all the time. If we be raw and, and just blunt, you know, me as a king, I don't believe in being fake. Like nobody that knows me know that I'm fake. I'm a real truthful person. If we look at the actual activity that goes on here, look at how I sow the greatest work, seed to you. So, if you watch me and I'm feeding your soul, what spirit is making you not want to feed me back? Just think about it. Is it God? The same Holy Ghost that's anointing me to feed your soul. Why wouldn't you want to feed mine? Why wouldn't you want to bless me the same way I'm determined to bless you? So children of God have robbed themselves of their supernatural laws. Because if children of God would take care of their man of God, if they would take care of their prophet, they take care of their teacher, they would see the father pour out a fresh move of God in their finances, in their health, in their minds, in their bodies, because now they're corresponding with sincerity and generosity and purity. And sowing is something that you have to choose to do. If you force to sow, is not real sowing. You have to realize, why am I sowing? Because this person is sowing into me. So now I want to sow back into them. You see that? Glory to God. Glory to God. So what you have to understand, a lot of my people, the reason why they so on fire for me, they're on fire for the Lord, because I don't force them to sow. I never have and never will. But I give them revelation to meditate, to seek the Lord, to realize, am I responding to divine presence at the highest level possible? We sow into people that plumb our toilets, plumbers. We sow into people that fix our kitchens. We sow into people that fix our cars. And we see them fixing a problem, so we give them money. But a prophet of God that is warring for your soul, that's feeding you the word, that's making sure that you have knowledge about what it takes to get into eternal life, and they're laboring for you. Imagine if you don't think that money from you should go to them. But yet you pay for people all the time to do stuff that that stuff not going to matter 500 years from now. 
500 years from now, your mechanic will not matter. 200 years from now, the person that you're paying car insurance to will not matter. But see, oftentimes you don't think like this. Because you become earthly minded. So you just think about the earth. But you are an eternal spirit. You have an eternal soul. And 150 years from now, you're not going to be in the same body that you're in. So imagine if you deem money more worthy to enter into the hands of people that are temporal, situations that are temporal, and not the gospel. That's a scary decision. Because then when you leave your body, you're going to need this God to be merciful to you. You're going to need the Lord Jesus to get you into eternal life. So imagine how could this Lord Jesus have any permission to bring you to eternal life if you disrespected his laws? King Jesus taught that you give. King Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. So, so he taught you giving, but he also taught you, taught you receiving. He told you to expect the harvest. It's, it's, it's the Lord. You see what I'm saying? So this, this, this is something that he wants, he loves. So that's Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. But Matthew chapter 14, verse 30, it talk, verse, verse 30, it's talking about a sowing test here. And this is what God does in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, God opens up doors for you and he pits it in your power to make money. And when you receive money, it's an opportunity for you to worship God with that money. Think about this. It's an opportunity for you to now correspond with God and sow into God. Now, now the Lord is giving you a chance to offer up the fruits that's worthy of repentance. That's what uh, John the Baptist said. He said, now offer up the fruits that's worthy of repentance. See, sowing is a repentance fruit. It shows that you have turned from your wicked ways. Because wicked people hate the idea of seed sowing. They hate the idea of giving God money. They hate it. But a worshiper, they love the opportunity to sow. They love the opportunity to give because they truly love God from a pure place. It's real. It's genuine. It's at work in their soul. See, I remember when I was a teenager, uh, no, I was actually a little boy at the time. I think I was like nine or eight years old, seven. And I was watching a man of God teaching on, on, on a TV station. And he asked, he was asking for a seed. And I said, I wish I had a thousand dollars where I could sow into this man. I was just a little boy. And that start me very young. I started sowing very early. And so people would give me like different favors. Like I remember I wanted a basketball court. I had sold that Sunday. And later on that week, somebody knocked on our door, our house. And they told my mother, they said, I want to buy your son, Joshua. I want to buy him a basketball goal. Can I do that for him? You can even come with me just so that you know it's not no tricky business. And they bought me a whole basketball court. And that was my desire. I love playing basketball. I knew how to play like Jordan shoot in certain aspects. And I was just, I was just excited about that. But that's something that I enjoyed doing. That became a paradise to me. And then by the time I was 14, I wanted to lift weights. I wanted a weightlifting thing. I wanted to work out my body. And um, I wanted just to exercise because at the time, you know, you into that sports mindset, that physique mindset. 
and somebody gave me a weightlifting machine. I had all type of weights on there. I think all the way up to like 500. And I had all these different um, gadgets that I enjoyed. I look back at those times when I was younger, I realized, hey, my sewing was causing people's hearts to hear God about me. And that's what King Jesus did. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. He said, good measure, press down, shaking together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. So saints, God gives to you, but he uses man to manifest it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so he uses man in the equation, but I understood very early how the giving power of God allows someone else to submit to God, to give to me. There are some children of God, the Lord is speaking to someone to bless them, but the person won't listen to God because the person is just doing what you're doing. You're not listening to God to give. And so they're hardened in their heart to give. And the only way for you to break that cycle is for you to learn giving yourself. Because give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Shall men give into your bosom. The men are given to your bosom. They're permitted to do it. They're empowered to do it. They're anointed to give to your bosom because you are giving to God's bosom. And God's bosom is your teacher. The person teaching you the word of God, they are God's bosom. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Abraham, he looked at Melchizedek and realized that Melchizedek was Saul to sow into. Melchizedek was a way that Abraham was going to unlock what God promised him. See, sometimes the Lord have promised people different great and great mighty things and they never get to it because every time God empowers them to sow, they just take the money and hide it. They use it. They take care of their children. They take care of everybody. They make sure everybody good, but they never take the money and use it for the gospel. And then when it comes time for certain things to manifest, they say, Lord, where is this? Why don't I have this? Why isn't this happening for me? And they miss the moments when they rob God. Whenever the Lord is ready to shift your life into greater favor, greater joy, greater pleasure, greater protection, greater peace, he going to put some money in your hands because it's seed to sow. Now, guess what? You can very well take that seed and eat it and don't give it to God. But when you eat the seed, you eat all the benefits that come with that seed. So a lot of times people left praying, Lord, bless me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, help me. And the help, the blessing, the, the prosperity, the favor was in that seed that they ate. So when you eat the seed, you eat the benefits that come with it. When you sow the seed, you reap the benefits that come with it. Now, saints, what did the Bible say that God daily loads us with benefits? So every single day, God has a loads of, uh, load of benefits that he wants to give you. So why doesn't it ever come to you? What's the secret behind that? If God daily loads you with benefits, why don't you get it? You have to learn how to sow. Now, sowing is a commandment from God. It's not just a theory. It's not just something that somebody will say, hey, I think that you should learn sowing. No, it's a biblical commandment. It's something that God says that he wants you to do. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6. It says, in the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. It's dealing with sowing here. And sowing, it is a divine law that gives you divine protection from diseases, sicknesses, infirmities. It gives you protection from all those things. Saints, I have not got COVID-19. I have not got any, um, I have not got any um, coronavirus of any kind. 
and I've been around people. I, I walked in stores where I had no mask on. Praise God. I just put the mask on so that they don't, so they don't, so that, because people are all crazy and scared. Look, look at them. Look at people. They're scared. They're scared. But you know what the Lord told me? People are not scared of coronavirus. They're scared of death. And see, man's soul, they know their soul not right with God. I'm not scared to die. Because as a matter of fact, I'll never die. Death lost its power. It don't have no power over me. I'm going to choose when I leave my body. I'm going to choose when I want to go. Didn't the Apostle Paul choose when he wanted to go? This biblical. And I'm not going to be taken out by no sickness, no disease, and I'm not worried about none of that. I have my sons around me. My sons, I don't never ask them to take a test. I'm not worried about diseases and sickness because it's an Egyptian disease. I'm not an Egyptian, so it can't kill me. Now, don't look at me all crazy. I'm speaking for you too. So don't look at me and say, oh, 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 well, how come? No, 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 no. I'm just speaking for you too. That's the statement that you should be saying too. Coronavirus is an Egyptian disease. I'm not an Egyptian. So I'm not worried about no coronavirus and I'm not worried about no diseases or no plagues hitting the earth. Coronavirus is a plague. I'm not worried about no plague because the Bible said in Psalm 91, no plague is not going to touch. A thousand fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. It will not come near you. I'm not worried about what's happening in this world because I'm operating from another realm. I'm a sower. My sowing has made me sore. Children of God must learn to start working the seed principle and honoring God so God can honor them. You reap what you sow. You honor the Lord with your substance, he gonna honor you with all that the kingdom has. We make exchanges. We make exchanges. Every time I sow a seed, I'm making it an exchange from, for something that is my inheritance. So protection is my inheritance. Deliverance is my inheritance. Freedom is my inheritance. Joy is my inheritance. Pleasure is my inheritance. Peace is my inheritance. Wisdom is my inheritance. Salvation is my inheritance. Every time I sow into God, I'm making an exchange. Remember, what did Job do with his seed? He said, I'm sowing this seed unless my children have cursed you, O God, in their hearts. So he was sowing for his children. Job. And remember, Satan couldn't touch his children. Remember, Satan said to God, there's a great hedge around him. I can't touch him. That's what seed sowing does. Seed sowing creates a hedge around your life. Now, let's go here. I want to show you something there. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse... Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse... Um, verse eight says this, it says, whosoever breaketh and hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoever breaketh and hedge, the serpent shall bite him. Now I want you to catch this. Some of you all don't even know that this scripture in the Bible, but look what it's telling you. It says that if you break and hedge, a serpent shall, uh, a serpent shall bite you. Now, Sowing is a hedge. And a lot of children of God are, are having serpents biting them financially. They're biting them mentally. They're stuck in wrong relationships because they have broken the hedge of seed sowing. When you sow in seed, if there's a relationship in your life that's not from God, God will cancel it. He'll break it off. Because the more you're honoring God, God is removing what is of dishonor in your presence. Whatever is dishonorable, God is severing the ties to it. Some people have not even sown enough into the Lord, into the gospel, for them to understand that their path is hoodwinking them. Their path is deceptive. It's wrong. But until they start honoring God with their money and honoring God with everything that he places in their hands, they're not going to have the veil lifted off of their eyes to see what is demonic and what is angelic, 
What is of light? What is of darkness? What is of the blessing? What is of the cursing? Seed sowing empowers your eyes, your soul, to comprehend what is the will of God for your life today. Every time you're sowing into the Lord, you're receiving his schedule for your life. Some of the stuff that happens to you is not supposed to be happening to you. You're not supposed to be getting kicked out of no houses. Evicted everywhere you go. You're not supposed to be underneath the yokes that Satan placing on you rather. Let me just say it like that. Because sometimes it's the will of God for you to get pit out of a house. I got to say, I got to be honest. Sometimes it's the will of God for you to be evicted because you're not going to leave and God been telling you to leave, but you're not going to leave. And sometimes the eviction is a divine intervention from God. Glory, glory, glory. Sometimes stuff got to happen. Somebody need to betray you because you ain't going to depart from them. Sometimes somebody need to do you wrong so that you can get away from them. You see what I'm saying? Seed sowing is the receptivity of the schedule that God has for you in heaven. You can't tell Prophet Joshua Holmes nothing. I'm a sower and that's why God made me sower. And my seed has destroyed satanic covenants in my life. My seed sowing has sanctified me from niggas. When I say niggas, I mean people with the wrong soul. They got the wrong intent. They got the wrong motive. They're not around you for the right reasons. People that try to compete with you. People that try to plot against you. The seed severs every bootleg covenant, bootleg relationship that's in your life. It sets you free from niggas. That's what the seed do. It sets you free from people that have slave mindsets. People that have cursed souls, people that love bondages. When you're a seed sower, you start seeing life, not from the pit, but from the presence of God. When you're a seed sower, you start seeing life, not from curses, but from Christ. You start seeing it from the lifestyle that God is living, the blessed lifestyle, the seed is going to destroy the serpent's power in your life. A lot of people of God do not have the serpent subdued. The serpent is still running wild in their garden. You know why? Because they haven't cut the serpent's head off with that seed. Remember, the seed crushes the head of the serpent. Until you become a sower of seed, sower of money, you will not have your foot on the devil's neck. It's impossible. Now, you can say what you want. You can say that you got your foot on the devil's neck, but... The seed unlocks harvests. How could harvests come to you if you're not a sower? So if the harvest not able to come to you, that means that Satan got his foot on your harvest. Satan enjoying your harvest, right? Because without seed, there's no harvest. So if there's no seed, then the harvest is going to be stuck underneath satanic presence, satanic rulership, satanic authority. The seed destroys the power of the thief in your life, destroys the power of curses, Sowing is the eviction of witchcraft in your presence. The seed is the eviction of satanic agents dominating over you and mocking your testimony as a blood-bought child of God. When you're sowing, you don't have to keep on talking about your dreams. Your dreams cometh to you through the seed. Remember, you seek you first the kingdom of God, all his righteousness, all other things shall be added. So a lot of stuff that you talking to God about that you want him to add to your life. It's in you learning all of his righteousness. It's in you learning the kingdom system of sowing. Now, saints, Ecclesiastes tell you if you break a hedge, a serpent will bite you. And that's why the serpent has been able to bite people with great destinies because they're not sowing into God. Every time you sow, you create a covenant. Sowing creates a covenant. If I create a covenant with the presence of God, now I have joy flowing from that covenant. I have peace flowing from that covenant. I have wealth and riches flowing from that covenant, financial abundance flowing from that covenant, because all those things are in the covenant. 